Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about fatigue and the spectrum of fatigue. There's different levels of fatigue, intermittent fatigue, and chronic fatigue. So let's go ahead and discuss some of this. Chronic fatigue spectrum. Now, there's normal fatigue, which is you work the double shift, you have to cook dinner, you have to take care of the kids, I'm tired. The other one is maybe you're traveling. You went to California, just got back, time difference, you have a little jet lag, that's normal fatigue. Now we also have intermittent fatigue, and these are episodes of fatigue during the month, the week, or the day. Month could be, I have menstruation, and because of menstruation or heavy bleeding, we have anemia, right, causing a, a, a fatigue. Fatigue during the week, it can be, I work normally because I rested on Saturday, Sunday, I work Monday, Tuesday, by Wednesday or Thursday, I'm pretty tired, I'm pretty wiped out. Episodes of fatigue during the day, this can be morning, late afternoon, evening fatigue. Chronic fatigue can occur due to multiple intermittent factors leading to chronic fatigue. It could be anemia, it could be stress response, it could be menstruation, it could be hormonal, right? Chronic fatigue due to specific disease. Let's say you have a genetic disorder like th uh, thalassemia, or you have an autoimmune condition that causes fatigue. And over a period of time, it can create chronic issues. Myalgic encephalomyelitis, or chronic fatigue. This is pretty serious. <clears throat> it creates a lot of uh, inflammatory processes in the brain, and it's a uh, process where someone is pretty fatigued all the time there is no real change in their fatigue level. So let's go ahead and discuss one type of fatigue, which is morning fatigue, okay? So chronic fatigue, mornings, could be due to obstructive sleep apnea. You could stop breathing in the middle of the night where you, um, you can pause for three to five seconds and then breathe again. So that could be a problem. Urination at night, insomnia, whether you're not falling asleep properly or you're waking up in the middle of the night. Impaired cortisol awakening response, that's an important one. So sleep apnea, how do you know? If you have loud snoring, you're not breathing or intermittently stopping, right? You wake up with a morning headache or you have mood changes, you're irritable, okay? Dry mouth, because you're op sleeping with your mouth open. Cortisol, Impaired cortisol response, one of the telltale signs is you get up, you have no appetite in the morning, or you may crave sugar. You're anxious or you're irritable in the morning, and you need to move to feel normal. What that means is you get out of bed, you don't feel normal, you're very sluggish, you just don't have uh, any energy. And you might just go ahead and start you know, going up and down the stairs in the house and you start to feel your energy pick up because of the cortisol response. And also those types of patients are the ones who grab that big cup of coffee in the morning. They need a big cup of coffee to get started every morning. Uh, traumatic brain injury creates brain, creates brain fatigue. Now this is um, not really discussed very often in mainstream uh, medicine because post-concussion or post-traumatic um, syndromes can create issues with brain fatigue. Urination at night is pros prostate hypertrophy, overactive bladder, or diabetes. So people who have sugar dysregulation will often urinate in the middle of the night several times, waking them up, and obviously overactive bladder and, and prostatic hypertrophy, or prostate hypertrophy. Insomnia, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Typically when you have a problem falling asleep, you have high blood sugar problems. So the classic example is you get home from work, you have a big dinner, and you sit down in front of the couch, and you start to fall asleep, you're not off. So you go upstairs and try to get to sleep, and you're wide awake, you can't fall asleep. It might take you an hour or two, okay? The other one is you fall asleep fine, but you wake up in the middle of the night, typically one, two, or three in the morning. Those are the people who have low blood sugar or hypoglycemic events. So those types of patients 
have low blood sugar problems, and the high sugar problems, patients who have high sugar problems will oftentimes nap throughout the day or fall asleep at night, and then when they go to bed, they can't fall asleep again. So those are some of the mechanisms of uh, morning fatigue, okay? On our next video, we'll go ahead and discuss some of the other mechanisms of fatigue, so stay tuned. Today, we're gonna continue on the journey of chronic fatigue. Last week, we talked about morning fatigue and some of the mechanisms. Today, we're gonna to talk about um, psychological stress, traumatic brain injury, and the inability to sleep. So let's get right into this. We already discussed this last week. Normal fatigue is when you travel a lot and you have two jobs and you have a family and just tired. Intermittent fatigue can be uh, related to a certain time of the month, a certain time of the week, or a certain time of the day, okay? Chronic fatigue has underlying mechanisms, right? Factors that influence fatigue, as also with chronic disease, like autoimmune disease, or, or hereditary trait like thalassemia can create fatigue. We also have myalgic encephalomyelitis, or chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a much more serious type of fatigue. So let's get into why we are not able to fall asleep. There are many mechanisms to this, but we're gonna talk about a few uh, today. So the inability to fall asleep, psychological stress, whether it's marriage, a sick child, post-traumatic, you're a veteran, right? There's psychological stress. Metabolic stress from insulin resistance or diabetes. Brain injury, right? Impacts to the brain. Vestibular or cerebellar, things that impact balance, okay? All these stresses will impact or increase cortisol, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. When you have an increase in these hormones, it creates an activation of the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system is a network of neurons in the brainstem. Okay? What it's responsible for is wakefulness, ability to focus, and fight or flight. Basically, these types of stresses impact hormones of affecting the part of the brain that is um, responsible for wakefulness, ability to focus, or fight or flight. So you have difficulty falling asleep as a result of it. So how do we take care of something like this? Obviously, if there's psychological stress, you wanna minimize the impact uh, on your stress in your life. If you have diabetes, you want to correct that or exercise or change your diet or think about a ketogenic diet possibly. Brain injury, this is much more complex. Even though brain injury may create these hormone elevations, it also creates a damage to the brainstem when you have concussions. So let's say you are playing football and you get hit really hard and your head whips back and forward. The, the brain might get injured in the the frontal lobe and the cerebellum, but what happens is in the brainstem, you get this kind of twisting motion, right, where the reticular activation system is, and it can damage that area also. And then vestibular problems, um, <clears throat> cerebellar problems, they also fire into that midbrain region, impacting those hormones. So brain injury is a little bit more complex, but essentially, if you have these types of conditions, you have to be able to modify this. You can modify diabetes. Brain injury, you may need some rehab from maybe someone who understands neural rehab uh, to integrate those areas a little bit better. And then you have vestibular problems. So if you have a balance issue, that needs to be corrected also. Uh, a functional neurologist might be someone uh, who might help you with that. So it's important to kind of understand what types of practitioners might be able to help you and what are some of the metabolic factors that impact the inability to fall asleep. Today we're gonna to talk about the chronically fatigued and can this little herb called rhodiola make a difference? So let's get right into it. Rhodiola plant, there are 200 different species from the Himalayan belt, Tibet, China, and Mongolia. Okay, it grows in dry terrain up in the higher elevations. In Chinese medicine, they use it for healthy aging, endocrine support, cardiovascular health, and immune stimulation, okay? 
Two major components of rhodiola are called sal salidroside and tyrosol. Adaptogen fights stress, depression, and anxiety. When they say adaptogen, if an herb is an adaptogenic herb, what it does is it helps to modulate something that is low and something that is high. So let's say your adrenals are very low. It will help bring up the adrenal uh, function. If the adrenals are over functioning, then it will help bring it down or calm it down. So it has a balancing effect rather than pushing it one way or another. Okay, so that's what an adaptogen is. There are other adaptogens that work synergistically with rhodiola. There are herbs that can help uh, enhance the properties of rhodiola. One is Pandas ginseng, ashwagandha, and holy basil. Those are the three. And what they do is they work synergistically. So if rhodiola has an impact of, let's say, 10% on your adrenal function, and you use the other herbs, it just doesn't go 10, 10, 10, a total of 40. It goes 80, 90, 100%, meaning it has a more profound effect when used in combination with other herbs that are synergistic. So oftentimes, nutritional companies will make adaptogenic formulas with all four or five different herbs with other support in there to maximize the synergistic effects of the herbs. So, how does it work? If you look at these systems, they're all loops. So when you look at the endocrine function, we look at the brain. So the brain, a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, will sell, send signals to another area of the brain called the pituitary. And it will signal the adrenals to produce uh, cortisol okay, and other hormones. And the adrenal uh, producing those hormones will feed back up to the brain and, and modulate it either up or down, okay? So it's this loop. And where rhodiola comes in, it helps to modulate this brain, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. So it helps to modulate this access, uh, access and balance things. There's also the brain pituitary ovarian access, brain pituitary thyroid access, brain pituitary and testes, right? So it has this big loop and rhodiola has a modulating effect in that loop along with the other adaptogens. So that's why it's not just an adrenal support, it's an immune support, it has balancing effects. Now, adverse, it's pretty rare, but you can get headaches, dizziness, or dry mouth. There are types of what we call proprietary blends, SHR5, WS1375. You can also get rhodiola in, in the plant form. And the dosages can be anywhere from 200 to 600 milligrams in divided doses per day. I would suggest take the, taking them earlier in the day, morning, maybe late afternoon, rather than at evening just before bed. But the divided doses anywhere from two to 600 milligrams can be beneficial. Now, obviously you wanna consult with your physicians before taking any type of herbal medication, but it has this modulating effect and it can be profound for some people when you give them rhodiola with other adaptogens because it can lift them out of uh, real chronic fatigue and get them better. Now, fatigue in itself or adrenal stress you have to remove some of the adrenal um, stress factors, right? If you're in a bad relationship, you need to get out of the bad relationship, right? If you have things that are constantly wearing you down, you have to look at your priorities and get rid of some of the things that cause your chronic stress. Stress and sleep is a big factor because when you sleep, you heal. So if you don't get proper sleep, it's gonna be problematic also. So lifestyle factor plays a lot into adrenal stress, so you wanna go ahead and manage that too, uh, along with trying rhodiola. Today we're gonna to talk about chronic fatigue, or mono, other known as Epstein-Barr virus. So let's get right into the details. So chronic fatigue, mono question mark, Epstein-Barr virus. Mononucleosis is an increase in a certain type of white blood cell called monocytes. 
Okay, that's where mono comes from. The most common cause is Epstein-Barr virus, or it's other known as herpes virus 4, or HHV4. Okay, so it's actually in the family of the herpes virus. Other causes for elevation of monocytes, or mononucleosis, can be cyclomegalovirus, adenovirus, toxoplasma, rubella, hepatitis A, and HIV. So when you suspect someone who might have uh, mono and the Epstein-Barr virus test comes back negative, it can be one of these other causes. So the Epstein-Barr virus is positive or what we call seropositive in 95% of the adults. Okay. What that means is pretty much everyone has caught it and has gotten over it. The problem is some of those patients, a small percentage, will have chronic Epstein-Barr virus or chronic reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. And we're gonna save that for another video. So teens and adults are the, the main population that tends to get Epstein-Barr virus. So they call it the kissing disease virus, right? When teenagers and adults you know, interact, you can get Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is in the oropharyngeal epithelium. What that means is basically the mouth and throat, basically saliva, or even um, just a little bit of um, uh, vapors from your mouth, uh, which has the virus in there. So oftentimes people are asymptomatic uh, in the beginning, and then they will develop symptoms. So, but the problem is here, that the asymptomatic patient who has gotten over the Epstein-Barr virus can still shed it up to six months. So they can still spread it. So that's why so many adults actually have the antibodies for Epstein-Barr virus. Incubation period is three to six weeks. That means you may not even know that you have the virus and then maybe three weeks after exposure, you may start to experience symptoms, okay? So symptoms, what we call the triad of symptoms, three symptoms, fever, sore throat, or swollen tonsils, right? And what we call lymphinopathy, basically swollen lymph nodes, especially in the cervical chain, in the neck, in the posterior chain. So you have inflammation of those lymph nodes. Other symptoms for Epstein-Barr virus include headache, malaise, muscle, and joint pain, and then occasionally, actually, um, with the spleen, about half the people will actually have an enlargement of the spleen, okay? It can become very, you know, big and then becomes an emergency and you end up in the hospital and all that stuff. But you have about half the population who have Epstein-Barr virus in the active form may have an enlargement of the spleen or splenomegaly. A small percentage will also have liver enlargement or hepatomegaly. And then when they take an uh, MRI or uh, CT scan, sometimes you can see this where you have the enlargement of the organs. Now, how do we test for it? Okay. The traditional test when you go to, let's say, an urgent care, wherever you want, uh, and they want to test for mono or Epstein-Barr, so they do a mono of spot test. It's a IgM and they use uh, sheep's uh, red blood cell. It's called a heterophile antibody test. The problem with this test is there are a lot of false negatives during the incubation period, that initial three to six weeks when you have it, uh, you develop a little symptoms, and, but you may not show on the monospot test. It'll be a false negative. Now, when they do turn positive, it only turns positive for like 80% of teens and adults. And in children, it's only like 40%. So they can have Epstein-Barr, right? And they don't know they have it, or they have mono, but they don't know they have it because it's only positive in like 40% of those who are positive. And only 20% in, in the ages uh, less than four, okay? There's another test called PCR, polymerase chain reaction test. This is a little bit more expensive to do. And what they do is they look for a qualitative, meaning they're looking for the presence 
of DNA of the virus. Is it there or not? Do we have it or not? Number two, they do a quantitative test, and this is the viral load, the amount of the viral load in our body. So those are the two tests. This is really not the best test. This is a little bit more expensive and it can kind of tell you that you may have it or not. What I like to do is something called a viral capsid antigen test, along with an early antigen antibody test, and an Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen antibody, which is EBNA. When we take these tests, we can find out if we have a active infection, past infection, or reactivation of an old infection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a separate video on this test and give you an idea of how to figure out if you have activation of an old Epstein-Barr virus. This is going to be a very important lecture for those people who are chronically sick or chronically have issues with fatigue, malaise. Okay? We're also going to connect the Epstein-Barr virus to Hashimoto's thyroiditis or thyroid conditions because the Epstein-Barr virus uh, has been known to trigger autoimmunity in patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So I'm gonna leave that for a separate video. This is gonna be a very important video in part two. Today we're gonna to talk about Epstein-Barr virus testing. How do we determine if you have an acute infection, past infection, or you have a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus? This is very important because some people will have chronic Epstein-Barr virus issues and cause chronic fatigue and health issues, and sometimes it'll impact the thyroid, uh, impacting Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So let's get right into it. The Epstein-Barr virus, you're looking for antibody testing. It's called viral capsid antigen IgM antibodies, or VCA for short and it will show up in the first exposure up to four to six weeks out, and then it'll disappear. VCA IgG antibodies appear in the acute phases and peaks around two to four weeks, and then it will persist for a lifetime. So it will show up once you've had it for your lifetime. There's something called early antigen, EAD antibody, and this uh, uh, shows up in the acute phases of Epstein-Barr and tends to disappear. However, in about 20% of the population, this antibody will persist and will be detectable for several years or some people for a lifetime. Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen testing or EBNA antibodies appears when acute phase is resolved. So you're out of the acute phase of the Epstein-Barr virus and it develops two to four months after the acute phase and it will persist for your lifetime. So this one and this one will, sh will persist and show up in your blood for your lifetime. So how do we determine if we have an acute infection? How do we uh, determine if we have a past infection or an activation or reactivation of the virus? So listed above is the individual test that we just talked about. So if you come and we test a patient and they're negative for all of them, okay, this first line, negative, that means that person has never had the infection, okay, and they don't have any acute infections, right? So they never had it and don't have the infection. They're susceptible to getting Epstein-Barr, okay? When you have a positive IgM, IgG, and a negative, negative, you're gonna have an early or primary infection, right? Because you have IgM that goes up initially. When you have a positive or a negative here, positive, positive, negative, that means it's an active infection still going on. Now, when we have a negative, so this is when hap the acute phase is, it shows up, this disappears, and then you have a positive, negative, positive, that means you had a past infection, okay? So this is where it gets a little tricky. You have a negative here, so the past infection is gone. Initial infection is gone here. And then you have a positive, positive, and positive. 
and that would typically um, indicate a reactivation of the virus. The only problem is that in this section here, you have 20% that might have persistent levels that are elevated after the initial infection. So you have to look at the clinical signs and symptoms of someone who comes in and determine if they have a possible reactivation. So if you're suspecting a reactivation, it's positive IgG, positive early antigen, and a positive EVNA. Okay? When you have these three, you can possibly have a reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus. Now the question is, how do we get someone healthy if you know they have chronic virus issues? It's not really about just killing a virus off. It's about building your immune system, right? Things that are good for your immune system, things like sleep, reducing stress, eliminating those factors that create issues for you like smoking and alcohol and all the other things. So lifestyle factors are very important. And I've made other videos on viruses, so I'll go ahead and put that link up. And uh, in terms of building your immune system, you have to have uh, proper lifestyle factors in place first before taking on all the nutritions and nutraceuticals that would help your immune system. Today we're going to talk about iron deficiency anemia, some of the signs and symptoms, what are some of the causes, and then in part two, we're going to go over the differential labs that can diagnose you with iron deficiency, as well as going over remedies, treatment options uh, that are available to improve iron levels for yourself. Okay, so we're going to go right into it. Let's go into iron deficiency anemia, hair loss, fatigue, etc. Right? There are a lot of signs and symptoms for iron deficiency anemia. So what are some of the reasons why someone who uh, may be iron deficient? One is the lack of intake or the lack of absorption of iron. So you might be taking in a, a iron but not absorbing it correctly or you might be lacking the amount of iron that is necessary. So number one is malabsorption. Why would we have malabsorption? Right? Some disease process or autoimmune processes will damage our gut lining to the point where it does not absorb nutrients very well, iron being one of them. So when we look at things like Crohn's disease, irritable bowel disease, celiac disease, or even ulcerative colitis, you're going to have malabsorption of nutrients and you can develop iron deficiency anemia because iron is one of those things that is necessary for proper oxygenation, right? Another is antacids. So antacid use is very high here in the United States. Whenever you have a reflux sign or burning, they give you an antacid. But what patients don't really realize is that antacids should be used short term, not long term. So sometimes patients come in and they're on antacids for two years, three years, even 10 years. So why is antacids creating malabsorption? Basically, you need stomach acid to break down your foods, right? Your fats, your proteins, your carbohydrates. If you cannot break down your fats and carbohydrates, etc., and the acid that you need is lowered because of antacids, then you will not break down the components and not absorb it correctly. So you may lack B vitamins, you may like, uh, lack iron, right? So antacid will create malabsorption of your nutrients. Other things that are surgeries, right? Surgeries like gastric bypass or small bowel uh, dissection because of, let's say, Crohn's disease. So definitely surgical procedures can contribute to malabsorption syndromes. The other is consumption is low or low consumption. What that means is for a lot of children here in the United States, they grow up on cow's milk. And what happens is rather than eating food as they get a little older, right, they start to just drink milk, like four, five, six, seven bottles a day. And they're getting the calorie intake. They're getting the vitamin D and, um, and calcium, but they're not getting their iron, right? So kids who drink a lot of cow's milk can develop uh, iron deficiency. 
Now, it, cow's milk is very different from breast milk, where breast milk would provide all the necessary uh, ingredients or nutrition for the child. But as they start to wean off and they're on cow's milk uh, for a long period of time, they will develop iron deficiency. The other one is vegans and vegetarians. And we're going to discuss this in detail next time, but basically vegetarians and vegans, uh, they're taking in non-heme uh, iron, basically, right? And it doesn't absorb as well as animal-based products, such as red meat or even seafood, etc. So vegans and vegetarians are notoriously uh, low on iron and B12 and B9, etc. So it's very important for vegetarians and vegans to check their iron levels correctly and then uh, supplement as necessary, okay? So there's another reason is loss of iron, right? We call it hemolysis or uh, hemorrhagia. Basically, you are either breaking down your red blood cells too quickly or you're losing your blood somewhere, okay? Here are the causes. Heavy menstruation. So when women get into the age where they're menstruating, about 10% of those people will actually develop iron deficiency, right? Because of irregular menstruation, heavy menstruation, right? Uh, endometriosis is another reason. Uh, large hemorrhoids or uh, uh, multiple hemorrhoids that cause a lot of bleeding can lead to anemia. GI bleeds. So GI bleeds can occur due to ulcers, right? or like things like varus esophagus, which starts to erode things. But um, NSAID usage, right? Pain medications, aspirins, uh, ibuprofens, right? They can cause damage to the GI lining if you're using it for long periods of time. And then it would have a slow GI bleed that you are unaware of and lose iron, right? Also cancers, nosebleeds. So people who get frequent nosebleeds, uh, for whatever reason, uh, will tend to develop some uh, form of iron deficiency. Another one uh, that people don't really realize is that urinary loss. People have blood in their urine, they don't realize that, right? It could be from a bladder infection or small kidney infection. Uh, so you could lose blood in the urine, so you should check your urine um, to see if there's any blood loss and make sure to rule these things out. Increased use of iron, right? So when we have um, child development, as you're growing rapidly, you're going to use more iron, right? Because you need to grow. So growth and development is a big thing. And also when the mother gets pregnant. So the mother is providing the baby or the fetus with all its nutrients. And basically you're feeding two people. And if the mother is not uh, on a proper diet, uh, and they're not uh, supplementing at times, especially in the third trimester of pregnancy, they can be iron deficient. Another one here is increased usage. Now, now this could be somewhere else over here, but parasites. People don't realize that parasites love iron. They can also create a little bit of bleeding or ulcers. So let's say H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, if you have a H. pylori infection that's significant enough in your stomach, it can create ulcers, causing a GI bleed. And two, H. pylori likes iron. So you have a double whammy in there, right? And then if you have GI symptoms as of H. pylori, because of H. pylori, because of the ulcer and you get reflux signs, now they might give you an antacid that you might take for a year or two years, and then that depletes more iron for malabsorption. So all these things can interplay, and you can have more than one of these conditions that can create iron loss, okay? So, when we look into different signs and symptoms, when we have a patient come in, we have a questionnaire, we ask questions about how they're feeling, right? One of the telltale signs is fatigue. Now, fatigue is a general term, right? It could be due to chronic fatigue syndrome, thyroid issues, etc. But iron deficiency certainly can create fatigue. Pallor, right? Your skin becomes pale and white. Your nail beds become white. If you look under your eyelids inside, it becomes white. So 
if you look at the patient's physical appearance, you can tell if they're pallid. Okay? Decrease in cognitive function. Let's say you start studying and about 10, 15 minutes into it, you become fatigued. You can't think as well. You can't absorb the material as well. The reason that happens is because of lack of blood flow. Studying takes enormous amount of energy, glucose and oxygen, to make it happen. So cognitive decline, if a child is struggling at school and they can't focus, right? You should actually check for iron deficiency in those children. Dizziness or lightheadedness, right? Dizziness because just lack of oxygen. And lightheadedness because you're not getting oxygen when you get up too quickly or you bend forward, you get up and you feel lightheaded, right? It's oxygenation issues. Patient might feel cold all the time, right? They don't look cold and it's pretty warm outside. They can feel cold though, right? Again, that can be related to thyroid, etc. But when you feel cold and then you have cold hands and feet, right? First, you got to rule out thyroid, but you also got to rule out issues with anemia or iron deficiency anemia. And then you can also get headaches because of lack of blood flow. Like things like migraines is, is a vascular uh, episode, right? Where it creates issues with the headaches. So iron deficiency can also create headaches because of lack of oxygenation or blood flow. Brittle hair and nails. Poor oxygenation, you're not getting the nutrients to where it needs to be. And your hair starts to fall out, get brittle, and your nails become brittle. And more advanced cases you're going to get spooning of the nails right so right there spooning of the fingernails canker sores can be a possibility with iron deficiency also or sometimes vitamin d deficient uh, vitamin c deficiencies uh, rls restless leg syndrome so restless leg syndrome is very common with um, iron deficiency um, in other cases it can be neurological um, because there are certain parts of the basal ganglion that play a part in restless leg syndrome. Increased heart rate. Your heart will pump hard, harder to get blood flow to the area because of lack of oxygen. So the heart const constantly pumps, trying to get more oxygen to a certain area. Shortness of breath, same thing, oxygenation issue, right? Pica. Pica is a condition where a patient might crave um, dirt. They want to eat dirt, right? Or ice cubes. They just want to crave uh, these weird things because they have a lack of iron. Chest discomfort, all goes with heart rate and shortness of breath and chest discomfort. But you can see that there are so many signs and symptoms that can be associated with this. Right? In our office, when patients come in, we have a, a, a therm thermometer, a surface thermometer, where we check the temperature between their forehead, their hands, and their feet to determine you know, what kind of temperature difference is there Right? Now, if your, your forehead is, let's say, 98 degrees and your hand is 95 degrees, but your foot is 80, you can have a circulation issue, you can have Raynaud's, you could have a thyroid problem, or you can have iron deficiency. Another way we can check is to check heart rate, obviously, in the office. If someone has a really rapid heart rate, cold hands and feet, then you can start to say, hey, maybe this patient has issues with iron, right? So those are simple ways we can check. And you can also get a pulse ox and look at the oxygen saturation, right? The oxygen saturation should be above uh, 98%, and in some people it will not be, okay? So on my next video, we are actually going to go talk about the lab tests that are necessary to determine someone to determine if someone has iron deficiency, and then two, how do we rectify these matters, right? How, what natural therapies can we use? What supplements can we use for patients who have iron deficiency? Uh, and what underlying mechanisms can you correct in order to help with iron deficiency? So stay tuned for part two. Today we're gonna to talk about iron deficiency anemia. Last week we spoke about all the signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia. But today, we're going to talk about lab markers. How do we distinguish someone who has iron deficiency anemia versus, let's say, a megaloblastic anemia? But today, our focus is going to be lab markers for iron deficiency. So let's get right into it. So 
The first marker we look at is red blood cell. Next one is hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCH, MCV, MCHC, and RDW. So what does this all mean, right? So when we look at this, we have red blood cells, and red blood cells have a concentration of hemoglobin in them, right? So hemoglobin is, is the hemoglobin in the whole blood. And then you have hematocrit, which is a fraction of blood volume uh, that's intact in red blood cells. MCH, or mean corpuscular hemoglobin, is the average number of hemoglobin in a single red blood cell. So there's many uh, hemoglobin in the red blood cell, okay? MCV is mean corpuscular volume. Mean corpuscular volume means the size of the red blood cell. And what that indicates is when it's very small, it's iron deficiency. If it's very large, it's a B12 or B9 anemia, right? So mean corpuscular volume in size means different things. MCHC is mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, and that is the average volume with red blood cells. And then RDW, red cell distribution width, and that's the abnormal uh, variation in size of the red blood cell. So the width is basically from small to large. The wider it is, as an indication that there are a lot of immature red blood cells, immature red blood cells, so the width of the red blood cells or the, uh, or the variety of red blood cells is very large, okay? So when we look at these numbers here, the numbers in red are indicative of uh, lab ranges. So if you're outside of the lab ranges, it's considered quote-unquote pathology, it's abnormal, right? So anything out of these red uh, areas is a clinical concern. The ones in the brown over here, this is indication of a male and that's a female, and the ranges are different from men to women. So when we look at red blood cell, men is 4.2 to 4.9, and female is 3.9 to 4.5. So the brown indicates ranges for optimal levels. So you can pick up subtle iron deficiency earlier on when you look at the functional ranges in brown versus the red ranges in the lab. So it's a good way of uh, distinguishing or teasing out early iron deficiency uh, when we look at the brown markers, okay? So iron deficiency anemia and lab testing. So these are just a lot of names, right? But at the end of the day, what does it all mean and how do we put it together, right? So when we look at iron deficiency, we just looked at what we call the CBC, right? Uh, a complete blood count. We looked at all the different red blood cell markers, MCV, and all those things that are related to red blood cells. There are other markers called um, iron markers. So we also have to look at do we have enough iron, serum iron? And then there's ferritin, percentage saturation, total iron binding capacity, transferrin. These are all different iron markers. And there's also a, um, a percentage transferrin saturation number too. But when you look at this, same thing, we're looking at lab ranges, and then we're looking at functional ranges. And they can be a little bit different from men to women. So, when we look at serum iron, it's the circulating iron bound to transferrin. Ferritin is the storage iron, right? When the ferritin is very low, it indicates iron deficiency. If it's high, it can indicate an acute phase reactant, meaning there's inflammatory processes that uh, are going on and the uh, ferritin number can go high, right? And then uh, total iron binding capacity is the amount of transferrin, right? The, the one that binds to the iron itself. Um, transferrin in itself is a primary extracellular protein that transports iron and is produced through the liver, right? That's an important fact because liver function is very important to actually iron levels. So, when we look at iron deficiency, the te technical term is called microcytic hypochromic anemia. Right? Big words, basically iron deficiency anemia. So what do we see? We just mentioned a bunch of different lab tests. 
And what do we see when we have iron deficiency anemia, right? So you can have a low serum iron, you can have low percentage saturation, you can have an increase in total iron binding capacity because basically your body is trying to bind more iron so the uh, binding capacity goes up. When we have iron binding capacity that's elevated, we start to think about mm, maybe there could be a GI bleed or issues with uh, iron uh, loss. So we can look at reticulocyte count. And what we can do is, um, when reticulocyte count goes up, we're looking at maybe a bleed somewhere, right? A GI bleed or something else. So the reticulocyte count is basically immature red blood cells. Uh, so the numbers keep going up, your body keep producing more reticulocytes. Ferritin will also be low. Red blood cell will be low, hemoglobin will be low, hematocrit, MCV or mean corpuscular volume will be low, MCH will be low, MCHC will be low, increase in red cell distribution width, and an increase in transferrin, and a decrease in transferrin saturation. So these are a lot of different numbers, right? So in my next video, what we're going to do is try to break it down and to see what is early signs of iron deficiency, moderate signs of iron deficiency, and severe loss, right? Basically, if you have everything here, it's pretty advanced uh, iron loss, right? So iron deficiency anemia. So we're going to discuss that in our next video. And then after that, we're going to discuss um, how do we improve iron absorption? What can we do? What can we take? or supplement wise uh, to enhance our iron absorption and improve iron, our iron levels. Today we're going to go ahead and summarize the different causes of iron deficiency anemia and what lab markers do we look at when we have different stages of deficiency. I'd like to thank Dr. Karazian for this little PowerPoint chart that he provided and let's go into detail about what is going on with dietary intake. So, causes and stages of iron deficiency. One, a diet low in iron. How can that happen? Typically with children, when they're drinking a lot of cow's milk and they're not eating a lot of food. So they're drinking four, five, six bottles of milk, yet they're not eating much of the uh, nutritious foods, right? Then they can develop iron deficiency. Eating disorders, obviously there's problems with malnutrition, and then countries where they have poor nutrition, right? Growth of tissue. This can occur where iron is being utilized in other areas. So when you have pregnancy and you're feeding the fetus, uh, especially in the third trimester, you can develop iron deficiency. Another is fibroids in women, right? Fibroids will grow with iron and uh, fibroids is one of those main causes for iron deficiency in women. Obviously, things like cancer, colon cancer, can be a, um, a factor for iron deficiency absorption. Poor iron absorption, right? How can that happen? Hypochlorhydria, or low stomach acid, or the chronic use of antacids, right? When you use antacids, it's meant to be used for a short period of time. But many people are on antacids for years or sometimes decades. And then that creates an environment where the stomach acid is too low, it does not break down the foods, and it does not absorb your nutrients, including iron, but B12, B9, and other nutrition uh, such as protein, right? So hypochlorhydria is a big problem. H. pylori, or helicobacter pylori, is a GI infection uh, it creates an environment that's more basic, and also it creates inflammation. So inflammatory processes, and then H. pylori likes iron. Leaky gut or celiac disease. Now, celiac disease is an autoimmune condition related to gluten. What happens with celiac disease is that it starts to damage the gut lining, and then absorption will be altered. So you have to look out for celiac disease. Parasites hookworm, pinworms, roundworms, right? These parasitic infections uh, can create a, uh, an iron deficiency state. Iron loss versus intake. You're taking in enough iron, but you're losing more than you actually take in. And the way that can happen is with 
GI bleeds or ulcers, right? Or colon cancer, okay? Or abnormal bleeding somewhere that's not detected. So when we look at the different stages of iron deficiency, we look at stage one. So if we look at the different causes, this kind of correlates with the severity. So from here down, will create these types of deficiencies and, and it will get worse as we get down into this chart. So stage one could be just low iron uh, intake or growth or tissue issues where they're sucking up iron, right? So stage one, iron deficiency, all you might see is a low ferritin, which is your storage iron. You might have low ferritin, but you have normal iron, iron saturation, a complete blood count, total iron binding capacity, and transferrin. So everything might be normal, but you're going to start to see a, a, a low ferritin number. Okay. In stage two, it gets more severe. So you're going to have low ferritin, low iron, and low iron saturation. And then you're going to have an increase in total iron binding capacity, transferrin, but you might still see a normal CBC, things like red blood cell, hemoglobin, hematocrit, etc. As we get more advanced in stage 3, as we discussed in the prior video, you're going to have low hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cell, MCV, MCHC, MCH, uh, and then you might see an increase in red cell distribution with a decrease in ferritin, decrease in iron, decrease in iron saturation, increase in total iron, iron binding capacity, and increase in transferrin. So what I'd like you to do is basically have this, or a snapshot of this, look at your blood work, and see if you have any of these numbers, right? If you have one of these numbers, you might have low uh, in the first stages. If you have more than one, you might have stage two iron deficiency. If you have all of them, you're in stage three. And it will correlate with this chart right in here, where you have low intake, uh, growth of tissue with fibroids and pregnancy, etc., poor absorption, and then obviously uh, frank bleeds or iron loss due to bleeding. Right? This is a great little chart, and I'd like to doc, uh, thank Dr. K for this chart. And I would like you to wait for the next video where we're going to talk about uh, the different ways we can improve iron absorption and what types of iron we can take to improve absorption in the gut. Today we're going to talk about iron deficiency and how do we improve iron absorption. Iron deficiency is pretty rampant here in the United States and there are many different causes. And if you'd like to know about the different causes and symptoms, go back to my first video where we discuss a lot of these uh, signs and symptoms of iron deficiency. Today we're going to discuss how do we improve absorption. Okay, so how do we improve iron deficiency anemia? One, you have to reduce inflammation, right? Inflammatory markers like CRP, calprotectin of the gut, or ESR, can be evaluated to see if we have inflammation. Inflammation will cause issues with iron absorption. So uh, finding the underlying mechanism for, uh, for inflammation is very important. So that leads to number two, is correcting the underlying problems, right? There are a lot of different causes, like I said, and if you went back to our other videos, you can see the different causes. However, if you look at it, things like heavy menstruation, fibroids, ulcers, autoimmune disease like celiac, Crohn's, or ulcerative colitis can all impact iron deficiency. So it doesn't matter how much iron you give these individuals, you have to correct or help the underlying mechanisms, right? If you have celiac disease, you can't have gluten. If you have Crohn's disease, it's an autoimmune disease, so you might have to modulate your immune system to dampen the autoimmune process. So you have to go after the underlying mechanisms here before you can give a patient a lot of iron so the iron levels can come up, right? Uh, one little clinical tip is that fibroids can be helped with things like green tea extracts, right? Vitamin D and resveratrol. So uh, if you have fibroids, you might want to use some of these in uh, ingredients or products to help with fibroids and improve iron absorption. So ulcers are caused um, due to stress. It could be due to H. pylori infections, 
So you got to correct the underlying mechanism there. Okay. You have to improve your diet, right? There are a lot of vegans and vegetarians who do it incorrectly and they become iron deficient. So um, taking in fortified iron is very different from taking in proper heme iron from animal products. So uh, we recommend some sort of animal protein, right? Heme is, is better absorbed and it's found in seafood, clams, oysters, uh, red meat, organ meats especially. So pro having proper levels of iron uh, in food is very important. Now, if we're a vegetarian and you're adding mostly plants, grains, etc., uh, you're going to have non-heme iron, right? And then there's also oxalates and uh, phytic acid in there. And what happens with it, oxalates is that it binds to the iron um, and it gets excreted out. So there is some issues with that. Now, if you take uh, green leafy vegetables, which is high in iron, and you boil it, then you're going to reduce your iron levels. So the best thing to do is probably steam your veggies and not boil them. You need to take in green leafy veggies, uh, dried fruits, raisins, uh, prunes or apricots, uh, pumpkin seeds, black beans, and there are other um, things that have iron in them. But again, uh, if you want the highly absorbable form, you need to have some sort of animal protein, or you may need to supplement. At the end of the day, it's not the worst thing, you have to supplement some iron, right? And number five, right over here, how do we improve absorption, right? Once we get to the underlying mechanisms, as you correct inflammation and some of the autoimmune disease processes and so forth, how do we improve absorption, right? One way we can do it is you take a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar and you put it in water and you can drink it before your meal, right? That improves the acidic environment in your stomach it helps to absorb iron better. So apple cider vinegar is one way. Okay? Another is taking some extra vitamin C. So vitamin C is known to help improve iron absorption, right, in the form of ascorbic acid. And then taking certain forms of iron is better than others, right? So the typical prescription for iron is iron sulfate. And they tend to absorb okay, but have more GI symptoms associated uh, with iron intake. So we like to recommend a ferrous bisglycinate chelate, right? It's a form of iron and it creates less GI upset. So less issues with digestive problems or constipation and those types of things. So we would like to recommend that. Uh, liver extract and then hydrochloric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid, again, is basically improving the acidity of the stomach and helping your digestive process to improve absorption. It's not going to just improve iron levels, but it may also help protein absorption, B12, B9, etc. So nutrient absorption is important. Oftentimes what you find is companies will make supplements or packets of supplements with these products in them, right? and helps to absorb uh, nutrients better. So they've done some studies where they've taken um, the ferrous uh, biglycinate uh, chelate supplements, right? And you took it and you compared it to um, uh, iron sulfate. And you can take less of this type of stuff right in here than you take iron sulfate. So they compared 25 milligrams of the ferrous form right in here against um, iron sulfate uh, at 50 milligrams. And the 25 milligrams did just as well as 50 milligrams of the typical prescription iron, right? Now there are other forms of iron, such as iron aspartate and, and picolinate that can be utilized also. Uh, but the one we like to use in our office is this one. It seems to work very well, gets the iron levels up, and then you have cofactors that help improve iron absorption, right? And now, there are many factors for iron deficiency anemia, but uh, you have to get to the underlying mechanism and then try to improve absorption of iron. Today we're going to talk about the mechanism of fatigue related to low blood sugar or reactive hypoglycemia. So let's get right into it. In order to understand how low blood sugar works, you have to understand normal 
physiology first. So when we look at normal physiology, when you eat during the day, you will utilize some of the glucose for energy, and then you will also store your glucose in the form of glycogen in the liver as well as skeletal muscle tissue. Now, glycogen makes up 5-6% to 6 of the weight of the liver, which is about 1.5 kilograms. So glycogen stores in the liver is about 100 to 120 grams, right, of glycogen. When you go into a sleep state, glycogen needs to be converted back to glucose for utilization for your bodily functions, right? Your brain need, is still active, um, your liver is detoxing, so you need uh, proper glucose stores. While you sleep, you use up 70% of your glycogen stores. So it has to be utilized during that sleep cycle, 70%. With hypoglycemia, because of insulin spikes or people with poor diets and skipping meals, it creates a lack of glycogen stores. So let's get right into the mechanism of hypoglycemia or reactive hypoglycemia. So when we have fatigue with reactive hypoglycemia, those patients are typically women, thin-framed, what we call skinny fat, right? They're thin, but they don't have a lot of muscle tissue. They miss meals during the day, right? And they'll just kind of like drink coffee or just have a donut, right? And then they have inadequate glucose for the production of glycogen synthesis. So they don't have enough glycogen stores uh, built up during the day. When they go into their sleep cycle, they lack enough glu uh, glycogen. They don't have enough glycogen stores in the skeletal muscles as well as through the liver, and then decreased glucose to the brain. Because the body is utilizing your glycogen stores when you sleep. Causes a stress response. So the fact that you don't have enough glycogen and enough glucose for bodily functions while you're sleeping, it causes a stress response. With the stress response, you have an increase in epinephrine and norepinephrine. That will increase your sympathetic drive, your fight or flight system. So it'll wake you, out, wake you up out of a deep sleep just because you have lack of glycogen and now you have epinephrine or norepinephrine going up and then now you're in a sympathetic state you get up wide awake I can't fall asleep again usually we'll wake up two or three in the morning and can't go back to sleep for an hour or two hours right it's because you don't have enough glycogen stores to sustain the blood sugar throughout the night you awaken and you can't go back to sleep that's one of the classic signs of low blood sugar um, uh, during the day. So, if you can't sleep, what is it going to cause? It's going to cause fatigue the next morning. You don't have enough cortisol awakening in the morning to get going. So you get up and you drink a big cup of coffee just to get going. Or you have to like move for your cortisol to go up. So we have issues. So how do we prevent this, right? You have to prevent a decrease in blood sugar. During the day, you have to eat small meals throughout the day. Healthy meals, meaning fats, proteins, and, and carbohydrates in the form of veggies with fiber. You have to maintain that blood sugar. We don't want this up and down in your mood. We don't want this up and down in your energy level because you eat or you don't eat. So you have to eat small meals throughout the day in order to level off that blood sugar. Right? And you can't have sugary stuff to do that. You must avoid insulin spikes. So you can't have a donut, a muffin, and coffee. Because right? all that does is it spikes your insulin and it drops your blood sugar again. So you go this up and down throughout the day in terms of your sugar dysregulation. You have to be able to stabilize that blood sugar throughout the day. You must make enough glycogen store. You have to have enough glycogen in the liver and in the muscle tissue 
before you go to bed. It takes time. Your body needs to adapt to this. So you have to avoid refined sugars, carbohydrates, and then you have to focus on uh, lean protein, high quality fats, uh, plenty of vegetables. As a matter of fact, I would recommend maybe uh, an avocado slice with turkey, um, organic turkey, literally like 30 minutes before bed, just to build up that glycogen store so you don't wake up in the middle of the night. So you have to do all three things in order to get stabilized. So these are the patients we don't want to start with intermittent fasting or ketogenic diets right off the bat. You have to stabilize their blood sugar first before you move on to a ketogenic diet or fasting with these types of patients. You have to be able to stabilize that blood sugar first, get them into a good sleep cycle and not wake up in the middle of the night. And then we can consider longer term uh, fasting and uh, uh, ketogenic diets. Today we're going to talk about some solutions for morning fatigue. That typical patient who can't get up in the morning needs to snooze maybe three or four or five times and needs a big cup of coffee to start their day. So let's go ahead and look at a typical patient. Typical patient that comes into our office tend to be female. They have low blood pressure, low blood sugar, high stress, either from work, relationship, school, and they need a lot of coffee to sustain themselves throughout the day. So that would be a typical patient. So this little graph right here is a what we call a salivary cortisol test. So your first morning cortisol, when you get up in the morning, should be very high. So it should be up in this zone right in here. As the day goes on, it'll drop a little bit and come down. And by nighttime, it should drop and you should be able to fall asleep. Cortisol is inversely related to melatonin. Melatonin is what makes you sleep, so melatonin will be high at nighttime and low in the morning, okay? So it's inversely related to melatonin. Now, when we do a salivary cortisol test for a patient who has morning fatigue, oftentimes they come in and their morning cortisol will not fall in here, but they may fall right about here. And then around noontime, it seems to be okay, it's kind of falling in here. And oftentimes afternoon, it drops down again. And sometimes in the evening, the cortisol can be high, all right? So instead of coming down, they kind of go through this wavy movement throughout the day. And that's, that's what we would find on a cortisol test in the morning. Uh, for some patients on a, a salivary cortisol test. Now, some solutions here. Now, there's many different reasons why someone might have low cortisol, but we're just talking about the average patient. Morning fatigue solutions. First of all, you have to reduce the stress. You have to identify what your stressors are and try to minimize those stressors in your life. That's just very obvious, right? Number two, you have to be able to sleep at a normal time or a normal schedule daily. Most people will need between seven and nine hours per night. People who have autoimmune disease or health conditions, they may need nine to 10 hours or 11 hours of sleep in order to heal. But typically, seven to nine hours is optimal in terms of function throughout the day. Number three, five minutes of aggressive exercise upon awakening. So when you get up, roll out of bed, what you do is you do 20 squats, 10 push-ups, 30 jumping jacks, and you do something for about five minutes. And the reason why we do that is you're retraining your body to produce cortisol first thing in the morning. So exercise or intense exercise will bump up your cortisol uh, first thing in the morning. So it's like ha having a cup of coffee. Five minutes of aggressive exercise, right? Kind of like a hit exercise program uh, for five minutes. It will retrain how your body will produce cortisol in the morning. Number four, cold showers. You can do one to two minutes in a cold shower. That will also release cortisol and uh, epinephrine and catecholamines and 
things that will just boost your energy first thing in the morning, okay? Number five, licorice or glyceriza galba. Lic licorice can be used for patients who have uh, issues with low cortisol. So first thing in the morning when you get up, you can take about 50 to 100 milligrams of licorice root, and that will help increase cortisol first thing in the morning. You can also use it at a time of day if you did testing um, around that afternoon lull where you get fatigued, you can use a little bit at that time. I would recommend maybe half the dosage uh, of what you use the first thing in the morning, okay? With licorice root though, you don't wanna use it for extended periods of time or forever. Um, for those people who have hypertension, you have to be cautious because it can increase blood pressure. Issues with potassium or aldosterone, which is another hormone. So you wanna be able to monitor this, right? So or work with a, a healthcare provider who understands how to use licorice root. Another thing you can use is adaptogenic herbs. Adaptogenic herbs like panance ginseng, right? You can also use ashwagandha, holy basil, radalia, uh, elethro. These are all adaptogenic herbs that can help modulate cortisol production. So adaptogenic means that if something is too high, it'll kind of normalize it. If it's too low, it'll bring it back into a normal standard. So you can use uh, adaptogenic herbs to kind of modulate your cortisol rhythm throughout the day. Oftentimes, uh, companies will produce products that have all of them together, and they recommend you know one capsule a day. So if that's the case, I would use one capsule twice a day and see how you do and see if there's any improvement. You can do higher doses of adaptogenic herbs to see if there's improvement. However, again, with herbs, you wanna use uh, or uh, uh, get the help of a healthcare provider who understands how to use herbs um, to help you impact low morning cortisol. But the first thing you should do is one, two, three, four. Then you can probably try licorice and then adaptogenic herbs, cut out the coffee, uh, cut out aids that help you improve energy first thing in the morning. Try to use this natural substances or, or natural herbs that can help you benefit from low morning cortisol. Today we're gonna to talk about a condition that is often ignored in the medical community or they simply don't have any answers for patients who have this. The condition is called chronic fatigue syndrome. Let's get right into it. The correct term should be myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Basically, it's a chronic neuro brain endocrine hormones immune system dysfunction. It's a vicious cycle that keeps going around and creating havoc within the body. It creates neuroinflammation, systemic inflammation, there's often a mitochondrial defect, meaning the, produce, uh, the ability to produce ATP, okay? There's often autoimmunity associated with it, and the HPA axis dysregulation. HPA axis meaning hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, how the brain talks to the adrenal glands for proper hormone production. It also has a dysfunctional uh, natural killer cells, and it's got barrier permeability issues, meaning gut barriers or leaky gut or intestinal permeability, or even the brain um, barrier, right? So there's things that should not cross the blood-brain barrier, and they may cross in creating neuroinflammatory processes. So it's a multifaceted disease, really, and it has to um, be given proper attention in order to help these types of patients. So what are some of the mechanisms of ME or chronic fatigue syndrome? Oftentimes that we find is there's a viral infection like cyclomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, herpes viruses this in general. <clears throat> there's one that impacts the brain called HHV6. So viral infection is one of those triggers. Autoimmune disease can also be a trigger. Chemical toxicity. I mean, we are bathing in chemicals, right? There is environmental pollutants everywhere, okay? 
<clears throat> so chemical toxicity, if you don't have tolerance for it, then you may trigger ME. Traumatic brain injury, <clears throat> very common. You have multiple head traumas and it creates neuroinflammatory processes that cannot be calmed down. Stealth infections, often ignored. Lyme disease, Bartonella, uh, Babitzia, mycoplasm. There's a lot of different stealth diseases out there or even intestinal parasites that have been ignored. Mold toxicity. There's a lot of sick buildings out there. Mold damage, right? Stachybotrys, penicillium. There's a lot of different molds that can impact your health. These all can impact or trigger a chronic fatigue syndrome patient. It creates post-exertional malaise. You exercise a little bit, wiped out completely. Fatigue obviously is a, a factor. Cognitive deficits or decline, immune compromise, right? Autoimmune symptoms, or I'm sorry, autonomic symptoms, where your uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic systems are off balance. Your fight or flight system is off balance. Stress response intolerance, tiny bit of a stress a little fight, some little trigger can take this patient from feeling somewhat okay to a downward spiral to feeling completely wiped out. All these symptoms will basically tell you you have ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. It is a very serious condition that is being ignored in the medical community. Today we're going to talk about the top five supplements to help improve sleep. Before I get into that, we made other videos about sleep hygiene, using white noise or a weighted blanket uh, to help improve quality of sleep. So you want to go ahead and watch those videos. The supplements you want to utilize after utilizing some of the sleep hygiene methods. Now, people can't sleep or fall asleep properly. Uh, it could be related to blood sugar. So you need to correct blood sugar problems. Or if you have anxiety, it could be a problem. So the top five supplements should be utilized after correcting other underlying mechanisms for sleep. So in terms of sleep quality, and the supplements are also great for chronic fatigue patients or ME patients uh, because their sleep uh, quality is, is disturbed. So number one, I like to use magnesium L3 and 8. Five, 300 to 500 milligrams 45 minutes to an hour before bed. Now, magnesium has a lot of endometric processes and is quite beneficial uh, for a lot of different processes, but it has a calming effect. So number one product I would use is magnesium, okay? Use this one first at the lowest dosage, maybe 300 milligrams, and see if it impacts your sleep quality. Do it for three, four, or five days. After that, you can add in methylcobalamin. B12 or the active form of B12, one to two milligrams in the morning and one to two milligrams at noon. Again, using the lowest possible dosages on the scale. So you would start with one, right? One milligram. Methylcobalamin helps to reduce melatonin during the day and it keeps that reserve for at night so it could be released. So that's why we're using methylcobalamin more in the morning and around new time rather than at the evening time. Passion flower, you can use this as a tea. Passion flower has been known to decrease anxiety, increase GABA, which is an uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter, improve quality of sleep, okay? CBD, <clears throat> 25 to 50 milligrams, 45 minutes before bed. Uh, there's a company called Charlotte Squibb, which has a pretty good product. Uh, it decreases nighttime cortisol and decreases anxiety so you can get more of a restful sleep. You can also use valerian root after that, 300, uh, 100 to 300 milligrams, 45 minutes to an hour before bed. You want to use 0.8% of the valeric acid form, okay? Increases quality of sleep and restfulness. So you don't have to take all five. You want to take the least amount of supplements to impact your sleep. So if you took magnesium and that 
improved or corrected your sleep issues, that's all you need to take. Then you can layer in methylcobalamin, passion flower, CBD, and valerian root. Okay. Always check with your doctors because you know it is a inhibitory neurotransmitter um, impact, and you always want to make sure that it's not impacting your liver and, and other organs. So always check with your doctors before starting on any supplement regimen. Okay. So those are my top five. I know there are others <clears throat> like 5-HTP, which can also help improve sleep. 5-HTP will increase serotonin, which is kind of your happy neurotransmitter. You can take 50 milligrams of it, 45 minutes to an hour before bed. You can also use lithium orotate, five milligrams before bedtime, okay? Melatonin, use the lowest possible dosage to make an impact. So whatever commercially available, you want to go to the lowest dosage possible to make an impact. Now, when you, again, when you use these supplements, you want to use it for about a week before you add on another supplement because one supplement uh, may do the trick uh, in terms of improving your quality of sleep and falling asleep. So you don't need to take, you know, 10 supplements to sleep. <clears throat> kava Kava also has a profound effect on sleep, sleep quality and so forth. There's a very small percentage they talk about uh, that it will increase liver uh, enzymes or liver damage, uh, but it's pretty rare, but you still want to check your blood work after taking Kava Kava and make sure your liver enzymes are not being elevated. All right, so those are my top five. Obviously, these are some of the other ones that you can utilize. The reason I put melatonin over here is because Melatonin will suppress cortisol if you use it for long periods of time. So you want to use melatonin over a short period of time to improve sleep cycles or people who <clears throat> work the night shift and so forth. Um, so melatonin shouldn't be our first go-to. Like I said, I like magnesium L-theanate uh, first. 